шелкового масла на стенках холдера, накид на тенах, молочный камень зовни та бактерии всередине. Теперь, дякуючи про сервис, власники кав'ярень могут не турбуватися про безопасность своего обладания, баристи про смак кави, а відвідувачі про своє здоров'я. Про сервис. Давайте поднимать культуру споживання кави разом. Ladies and gentlemen, put your mobile phones into silent mode. The show begins right now. We have three speakers left for you here on the Star Stage Barometer 2019 in Kiev and three amazing talks. They really saved the best for last in this afternoon series of seminars and educators. I'm very honored to be able to present the next speaker on stage, the elusive Ted Haig. I believe he hasn't appeared uh, at a seminar like this for over 10 years, but he started his history way back in the 1990s uh, when he joined AOL as Dr. Cocktail. And since then, as a cocktail historian and writer, published many books that you would have heard of. And I believe the, the latest uh, will be coming out this year. He's actually, many people don't know, uh, in the film industry as a designer uh, of sets and working with many films, claim to fame, he was the bartender in Superbad. But you all know him, and you will love him. So please, Kiev, can I ask you to be upstanding? And welcome on stage, Dr. Cocktail himself, Mr. Ted Haig! Hey, hey. Thank you, thank you. Very nice, that's, that's good. Welcome to the o Kiev branch of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> Actually, 
It's true. I have not been up on a spirits-oriented stage for 10 years. I've been concentrating on my film career. Dr. Cocktail is great, takes me around the world, but I get a better health plan with the, you know, film business. Now, I, I am not a public speaker, not at all. If you hear something that sounds like you might want to laugh, go right ahead, really. I'm told that you're a very respectful audience, so, but do. I mean, so for instance, if I were to fall down on the stage, first check to make sure I still have a pulse, and if I do, laugh. All right. Okay, so I've got everything I'm going to do here on this thing, more or less. Come on, there we are. Okay. This, uh, the, the things I want to cover are basically roots, because it's the theme of the show, and cocktail archaeology, which means essentially anecdotes about what I had to do to find out about cocktails, which began a very long time ago. But roots are, of course, exactly what I've always been about, because roots are the history. They are, they are what built the foundations that eventually got you here today, and for the past three days. Um, Finding out about that stuff, being able to, to, to suss out what all of these things were, was very hard in a small rural community in the United States in the 1970s. And that's when I started doing it. Uh, I was not interested, I was a nerdy kid. I was not at all interested in any of the stuff the other kids were interested in. All I wanted to look at were the black and white movies. So it was just a sort of a strange situation there. And, uh, but for instance, I can go back even further. I can say elective drinking, the idea that you're going to calculate to do something, not necessarily because you're thirsty, but because you want to try something, an experiment. That would have happened with, to me about when I was seven years old. And at that point, I had watched an old cowboy movie. And in this cowboy movie, the guy was dying of thirst. Crawling up, he found a river. He took off his cowboy boot, filled it up full of water, and drank from it. So I, at seven years old, having my own little cowboy boot, I went to the bathtub and I filled it up with water and I drank from it. It sucked. It was terrible. It was terrible. But that's elective drinking for you. This happened. It has happened with cocktails too. All right, so that's the boot story. Now, the next story, one year later, eight years old. My parents were not drinkers. They would drink maybe a glass of wine at Thanksgiving. That's the kind of people they were. So I knew nothing. I really did know nothing except what I'd seen in the movies. So, uh, let's see. Uh, so, somehow in the backyard, I found an empty vodka bottle. So I thought I was going to do what I saw them doing in the movies. So I filled it up with water and poured a lot of pepper in it thus inadvertently creating vodka pepar, for which I have never gotten any royalties. It's a terrible, terrible situation. But after that, after that, we could take this on to about 15 years old. And at 15, 14, 15 years old, I'm crawling around in my dad's library because my dad loved books. I loved books. He sold books. I, I stole his books, and he, um, on the very top shelf, the only shelf he would allow paperback books on, I found a copy of Patrick Gavin Duffy's official mixer's manual, one of the first books to come out after Prohibition ended. And Prohibition's 100th year anniversary, by the way, is this coming year, 2020. We're thinking about it. So anyway, I got, I, I got down that book, and I didn't know what anything was. I didn't know what gin was. I didn't know what anything was. But they also had things in there like creme de noyau and forbidden fruit. And 
it, it just, it was, it was an amazing fantasia. And the drink names, things like the loudspeaker cocktail, the little devil, the corpse reviver number two, and the bosom caresser. Well, it was a long time before I could try them, but I realized then I wanted to because it occurred to me, this is what they were drinking in those movies. The movies I like, the W.C. Fields movies, the, uh, the Thin Man movies. So, so I continued. I kept it in my mind. I kept it in my mind. And when I was, I don't know, college age, hold on, let me do this here. Sorry. Um, I tried to make them, but I thought, if they asked for half an ounce of something, wouldn't it be better if you just poured the whole bottle in there? So I tried that, and I got terribly sick many a time. If they called for fresh, fresh uh, lime juice, what about, what about if I just used a bottle of roses in there? So it worked out just about as well as you'd think. Now, let's segue to 1990. I've, I'm now an adult. I've worked my way into the film business, and suddenly I'm moving out to L.A. because I had a production designer who thought I was talented, and uh, they, she would give me a place to stay, and so on and so forth. So by that time, I was finally able to find one ingredient. I'd seen it defined, but I didn't really... I'd never tasted it, I'd never found it. Virginia, where I was born, had uh, what they called al alcohol beverage control stores, where you went to the state. It was a state monopoly, and they didn't have this stuff, and it was Lillet. It was what I knew as Kina Lillet at the time. So I went, um, I found it in a liquor store in LA, and I got it, and I went back pretty much with lab equipment and made myself my first Corpse Reviver number two. It was amazing. It just spun my head around. You could taste every individual thing in that drink. You could taste the, the sort of maltiness of the, and, and the slight orange lilt of the uh, Lillet. You could taste the Cointreau the orange in the Cointreau. You could, you, could tell, you could get the snap from that gin, and it had just a hint, and lemon juice, and it had just a hint of absinthe, absinthe in it. And the, uh, except we couldn't get absinthe back then, so it had to be a pastis. But I was so careful, given my high school days, I was so careful, I, like an eyedropper. And it was just the most amazing drink. So at that point, I was, I was fully invested. I, but there is no internet. 1990, nothing of any value there. So I'm looking, I'm looking everywhere. I'm looking for what can I find. I, can, I found books. I found old books in bookstores. I would buy everything on the subject. And there wasn't a lot. Cocktails at that point were still fuzzy navels. They were essentially a, they were an extension of the last thing that had happened in the cocktail world. What had happened in the cocktail world since cocktails? Cocktails had essentially, prohibition was both a, a boon for the cocktail because they, it came to Europe. It came to Europe and they didn't necessarily have all the same ingredients, so they'd substitute ingredients. We'd get Secrestat bitters instead of Angostura, or they'd, uh, and they would use fruit juice in it, something that Americans had not come to grips with yet, because certainly when Americans started the, cock the, 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 the cocktail, well, the cocktail was considered a very bad thing. The cocktail was a morning after potion, and uh, first came out around 1800. I think Thomas Jefferson was still president at that point. And the, the first newspaper was from a place in Connecticut, a little town in Connecticut, in a newspaper called the Farmer's Cabinet. And all it said was some 
younger person had left a sheaf of papers that fell into the gutter. And they fished it out, and they saw how they were drinking cocktails. And it was a morning after thing. And then, three years later, in Hudson, New York, the balance in Colombian repository, they actually defined it. But again, it was all part of an insult. Because what they said was, rival politician. This was like a Whig newspaper, and, and the other party at that point was, were the, the Democrats, or yes, the Democrats. So they were like, he was feeding all of these people cocktail. And what is a cocktail? A cocktail is a kind of bittered sling. Well, what was a sling? A sling was water, sugar, spirit. If it was in season, they could get ice for it. If it wasn't, you drink it warm. A bittered sling adds bitters. Why would they drink it in the morning? Because bitters were medicine. They, they halfway still considered gin medicine at that point. This, this is 1800. You know, so bitters were really considered real medicine at that point. So they put that together and they would drink it in the morning. It was just very bad form, very bad form. The only people who really liked it were journalists who'd been known to drink a little bit and bartenders. And so uh, newspapers would start covering the cocktail. They would, they would, they would cover the cocktail. They, they would write whenever anybody invented a new one. Then, uh, you know, it took 60 years after that for somebody to get the guts to put one in a book. And that was Jerry Thomas. You guys know who Jerry Thomas is, father of the cocktail. What he had really done was scan all the newspapers and get everything he could get out of that. At that point, there were, there were like five cocktails in that first edition, and the rest were punches and, and uh, you know, fizzes and, and slings and, and all that sort of stuff. All of which eventually, as pop cocktails became popular, became cocktails. So if you order a Singapore sling, you're ordering a cocktail, even though it's a sling. Or a mint julep, which predated the cocktail. All of those, all of those things became the cocktail because the cocktail had the advantage of being a sort of a freewheeling thing that could contain anything to the point where, you know, within our recent history, you'd have things like what they called an AIDS cocktail, which was just a group of drugs put together to, to cure or fix this disease, to, to have this particular effect. Molotov cocktail. Again, mix these things together, throw it to have the desired effect. Thank you, thank you. I love the Ukraine. Screw Russia. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Anyways, but let, let's get back to how I started finding this stuff. Okay, I found some books. Now, but they were still putting in books that Abbott's bitters were still made. Books that were coming out in the 1970s and 80s. <laughs> and even 90s, and, 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 and I couldn't find them anywhere. I knew that they were made in Baltimore, couldn't find them. I, I was beginning to doubt that these writers knew what the hell they were talking about. Well, I put that aside. That was impossible. But then a book came out by a guy named Philip Collins. This guy wrote, he did stuff for, at the time there were two publishing companies in the United States, Abbeville Press and Chronicle, they published these gorgeous picture books. I mean, they were, they, in this case, they were cocktail recipes. They'd have a recipe on one page and just the most beautiful drink in a beautiful, incredibly expensive glass, beautifully lit. And, they, and one of the drinks in that book was the Satan's Whiskers. 
another favorite of mine, very orangey. And in it, Philip Collins called for orange bitters. I said, that's it. Somebody is making orange bitters. How to find, how to find. I went around LA. As a matter of fact, in one weekend, I went to 60, six zero liquor stores. Not just looking for orange bitters, but any old thing. I was like, what do you have that's old? <laughs> I got various responses to that, but, and, and I actually was able to find a little bottle, we had a distributor named Shefflin, and they put out this thing called Old House Orange Bitters, still amazing orange bitters, and, and I figure the bottle I found had come out in the early 1960s, and that's probably the last time the stuff was made, but it was still good. And they added to their orange bitters something that nobody has done yet, again since, which was ginger. And the ginger and the orange, it really made a great cocktail. But while I was looking, before I had done the, the uh, weekend of 60 liquor stores, I thought, what else can I do? How can I find it? So I start calling up the liquor stores, and that's how that whole 60 thing happened. But I was frustrated because nobody was able to tell me a thing. They knew nothing. So I think, what can I do? So I thought, who would know best? Who would make orange bitters? Who would know best? And I thought, they're competition. So I made a phone call to Trinidad. I went to talk to Angostura. And because this was like 1989, 1990, whatever, it, it was so unexpected, they put the CEO on the phone with me, and a guy named Clive Cook. And what he said was, oh, well, you know, what we recommend is, you take some orange peel, and you mash it up a bit, and you put some Angostura in it. That's what we use. I was like, well, that's fine. But nobody really is making this stuff. And he said, let me put you in touch with my US counterpart. So they did, a guy named Jack Margette. So, Jack Margette, what's the first thing he says? Oh, oh, and let me tell you right now, between the time I had called Clive Cook and I was put in touch with Jack Margette, I thought, here's the other thing I'm going to do. I'm going to call up Chronicle Books, find out how to get in touch with, with, you know, with Philip Collins, and find out what he had done. And so uh, that phone call was there. I wasn't getting any immediate phone calls back. So I call up the US counterpart with the number I was given for Angostura. And what does he say? He says, well, you know, what we recommend is mashing up some orange peel and some Angostura. And I said, yes, 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 yes. But is there somebody? And they said, well, yes. There's a company out of Rochester, New York called Fee Brothers. They sell it regionally there. So I call up Fee Brothers. Fee Brothers, they are, sound very confused on the phone. So there's a little rumbling around and, well, okay, talk to him. Hello, this is Jack. Well, Jack was the CEO of Fee Brothers. So I was getting another one of those again. Yes, we make orange bitters. We do, we make it. That's great. Where are you? Los Angeles? Well, yeah, we'll sell you a bottle. You, we have a nice grenadine too. Okay, I'll take that too. Okay, great. We'll have to bill you 30 days net meaning as though I was buying a truckload of the stuff. That's the only way they had to bill me. So th that's what I did. That's what I did. I ordered it, orange bitters. I made my Satan's whiskers. It was wonderful, wonderful. And there's so many stories like that. This is, this is in microcosm how you did research for this sort of stuff. And some of the stuff I would end up finding doing this, this sort of 
these sort of forays would be, I wouldn't know what it was, but I would know it was old. So I would get it. And at least in a couple of cases, what I got, when I got in touch with the company that made them, they were like, can we buy that back from you, please? No. <laughs> that happened with, uh, with a kind of whiskey, a kind of blended whiskey. You guys know what blended whiskey is, right? It, here's what I say blended whiskey is. You take this bottle of bourbon, this bottle of vodka, mix them half and half. That's your blended whiskey, more or less. Uh, except usually it's more vodka than, yeah. And it's not vodka because it's not nearly as refined as vodka. But we're dealing with the light whiskey thing, which is one of the terrible things that happened after the cocktail. Terrible, terrible time. So anyway, so where was I? Oh, yes. So they wanted to buy that. And the other one was a product that Angostura had put out back in about 1912 called Corypton. I found a bottle of Corypton. It's not spelled like the kryptonite from from Superman, but it, uh, anyway, it was equally bizarre. They wanted to buy it back too. And I didn't know what that was. I finally found one little guide. And this is often how I found out about anything. One little guide. And it, it turned out to be, do you know what falernum is? Falernum is, is kind of a, a, a spice syrup that is most famous in its use in tiki drinks. So it had these sort of apple pie spices, your, your mace, your nutmeg, your allspice, your, your uh, clove, and so on and so forth. And, and they mixed it up in, into a, a nice emulsion sort of thing. And, and it was in a bottle, not alcoholic. And, and there were still a couple companies who made that stuff too. But anyway, Corypton was that with booze in it rum specifically. So they wanted it back. <laughs> they didn't get that one either. And, and so it sort of went through the years. When the internet finally did happen, well, this would be about 1995 for me. I still, still did not really understand what the internet was. Okay, so you get this little place, this little piece of, of real estate on the internet, on the internet, and what do you do with it? This is my favorite color. You know, I, I didn't get it. But I sort of start up a little cocktail bottle, spirits museum on the thing. But at that point, websites didn't have names. They just had a long string number. So it wasn't the easiest thing for anybody to find ever anyway. There were no good, look, if you type cocktail as a word into the wide open internet back then, you're just gonna get a load of binary. Ones and twos, ones and zeros. So it was pretty useless. But then somebody told me about this amazing thing called America Online. So I went to America Online and I said, give me an account. Actually, it went nothing like that. Somebody said, you can use my account. This is email. I heard the noise. Somebody sent me an email. There was no spam back then. There was no spam. So, so I eventually got my own account. At that point, I was dating a really pretty gal. And we were both terribly cynical people. So I said, we should have our own email accounts. You give me my name and I'll give you yours. So, she gave me mine and I gave her hers. And I went on to AOL very timidly and noticed there was a cocktail section. There was actually a, a spirit section, a cocktail section, a wine section, and something like a brandy section, but we don't care. Anyway, so, I start timidly answering questions. People would say, what is this? And I'd go, well, that's, that's this. this what, um, what is Calvados? Oh, that's like cognac, except it's made in Normandy, and it's aged in the same kind of oak, limousine oak, and, but it's made with apples. 
And I, so just one thing after another like this, this is what I'm doing. Well, eventually, and I made some really interesting friends back then. Gary Regan, Art of the Mixology, he was on it. He, he, had, uh, he hadn't done Art of Mixology yet. He had done the Bartender's Bible, which after getting in contact with me over AOL, he kept apologizing for I'm so sorry. I'm really sorry about that because it was, it was not that great a book, but it sold millions for him. And it let him eventually write The Art of, Art of Mixology, which was a wonderful book. Anyway, I met all those great people, but they knew me by my initial name. And one of them, I, I don't remember who, said, you know, you really need a better name reflective of what you're doing. So I said, oh, okay. So I just, I just picked a name out of my head, Dr. Cocktail, put it down, was Dr. Cocktail at AOL.com available? Yes, it was. So I took it. I became Dr. Cocktail. And within one day, AOL's Food and Drink Network contacts me, wants me to be the, the maven for the cocktail section which I did. Why they didn't want me when I was still aging wino at AOL.com, I don't know to this day. Now, uh, by the way, my girlfriend's name was Elitist Shrew at AOL.com. Those are the names we gave each other. Nice, isn't it? Well, and so life goes on. We're still trying to figure out where everything is. At some point around here, I, I combine with Martin Duderoff on CocktailDB.com. It took my old cocktail museum concept and, and added a lot of drinks to it, drink recipes you could sort uh, and scale, and it showed all my old bottles that I'd gotten. And at some point, before that happened, because I was in the movie business, I did a movie in Chicago called Baby's Day Out. It was a John Hughes movie. And I was thinking, this is gonna be great. Chicago is a drinking town. And two of the stores there, two of the liquor stores there said, we're the biggest liquor stores in the world. So I, I was honor bound to go to both of them, which I did. And what did I find there? Same stuff in all the liquor stores. Maybe other brands, same stuff, nothing old. I was pissed. I, I was driving around in my rental car going, God damn it, I don't, want the, I don't want the biggest, I want the oldest. And right then, whizzing past me on a shingle sign, said Chicago's oldest wine and spirits merchant, House of Gluns. German guy who'd come to this country in the 1880s and opened a liquor store. He actually had Illinois' first distiller's license. And it was still legal after prohibition. They didn't use it, but it was, it was an amazing experience. So I went in there. But like my 60 stores in LA, I went in there with caution. I didn't want to get overly excited about what I didn't think was going to happen. So I'm in there. First of all, I see most of it's wine. It's just wine. And I thought, well, that's fine, but it's not what I'm looking for. And, and uh, a young clerk comes up, what can I do for you? Well, I was just looking for old spirits and so on and so forth. Spirits, we've got some back here. It leads me to a shelf, pint bottles of Jim Beam. That's what it was. Nothing's wrong with Jim Beam, but it was obviously not good writing on the wall for what I was doing. So I'm pretty much kind of like the, just backing out the door. No, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you anyway. That's fine. Let me bring the owner out. No, 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 don't do that. Uh, they did. And my book was dedicated to him. And here's why. That the store had not moved from its location since Lewis Gluntz opened it in the 1880s. Same building. And he, David Donovan, 
said, yeah, we may have something you'd like. He opens up a cabinet that I couldn't have seen in and pulls out a pint bottle of a German plum brandy, which, given Louis Glunz's imperfect English, he'd written prune brandy on. Mmm, sounds delicious, doesn't it? Anyway, so he pulls it out, Svetchenwasser. And, and I'm like, just holding it in my hands, I was like, oh, you better take it before I drop it. <laughs> and he says, here, have some pop. And he pulls out a little plastic cup, and I taste it, and I can still taste fresh plums. And it was distilled in 1913 and bottled in 1933. To this day, I have goosebumps running up and down my arm just thinking about it, that, that first experience. And over the time I was doing this movie, I make friends with him. And I'm there every weekend. What do you got for me now? So I buy a couple bottles of the Svetchenwasser. He pulls out rum. He pulls out what was arguably the last of the, of the London, uh, what did they even call it? I can't even remember now. There was a, oh, Medford rum. Medford, Massachusetts used to make a world-class rum. I mean, rich and hearty and flavorful and tasting great, but Prohibition killed it. They just killed it. I mean, after Prohibition, they had something, a brand they called Medford Rum. It was nothing, you know. So, but he pulls out one, it was called National Rum, but it was a Medford Rum, and I tasted it. And again, it just made my head explode. It was so good. Oh, oh, oh. And then he pulls out a bottle of, this doesn't sound very auspicious either, bourbon deluxe. Like any really would call itself bourbon deluxe. Well, it was. It was another one of what we call, what I call a prohibition leap bourbon. It was made before prohibition and leapt entirely till after prohibition before it was issued, meaning they weren't, it's said for medicinal use only, because that's the way you could get liquor, liquor legally during prohibition. They had prescribing pharmacists who would, who would, were allowed to sell pints, only pints, nothing bigger than a pint. And that's, by the way, where bootlegs came from too. Uh, there was a women's fashion with Russian boots and they were wide and you could stick a pint right down them. And that's how that term came to be. But anyway, so back in my high school days, back when I was mixing everything wrong, I was working in a country club as a busboy. And one day, two waiters and the other busboy didn't show up. And the alcoholic maitre d', gravel-voiced, red-haired woman, she did the most magnanimous thing she could do. She gave me her fifth, that's like a fifth of a gallon or four-fifths of a quart, if you want to understand American bottling nomenclature of the time. She gave me that, the one that she would normally drink all the way down every night of her life, and she gave it to me. And I was like, ha, oh, is the party gonna happen now? So, back in my apartment, I'm in, in, inviting old friends over. I don't know if any of you are aware of a band of a hard, hard rock costume band called Guar, but future member of Guar was one of those friends, yeah, the sex executioner. And so I'm drinking this and, <laughs> well, hold on, hold on a sec here. 
filled this up. And just went glug, 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 glug. And they were like, God damn, I didn't know you could drink like that. And I went, that's funny. So anyway, that kept me off whiskey for, I'm just gonna lay down for a while. Um, okay, so. <laughs> that kept me off whiskey for 15 years. The mere smell of bourbon was enough to make me nauseous. So, when David Donovan pulled this stuff out, I said, 15 years later, I said, pour me some of that. Well, he did. It was wonderful. It was like a brandy. It was so, so rich and flavorful. And it totally turned me around. I can drink whiskey again. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, and anyway, long story short, we became great friends. And I ended up shipping several cases of antique booze back to LA. Oh, and I still have them. Oh, it was just great. And, and that's when I knew I had a book in this. That's when I knew there was a book to be done. So I'm working on this and working on this, but I'm still in the film business and the whole thing was kind of like a fever dream. I didn't know who was gonna do a book. I didn't know exactly how I was gonna write it. But, and I've said this to some dear friends of mine here, procrastination can be a virtue. It has been for me. So I'm just, I'm going on with my film life. Suddenly, I'm working on the biggest film in Hollywood at the time, Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events. And I get a phone call. It's a publishing company, wants me to do a book for them. They said, we will tailor it for you, no matter what. You do what you do best. And I found out later that uh, uh, a somewhat well-known actor named John Hodgman had recommended me to them. So I did it. And again, as this would repeat itself through my writing career, they wanted like 122 pages. I gave them 222, but they published it and it became big. And this was in 2003, the cocktail world took notice. I would go on little, I went to Jonathan Downey's bar in London on a little junket that I got invited on. And there was a copy of my book behind the bar, <laughs> you know, and, and the same thing. I would go down to New Orleans, Somebody had my book back there. So there's me and Robert Hess, and I forget all else, tittering like a bunch of girls. <laughs> Look what they got back there. <laughs> so that bartender was like, what's up? And so it, it sort of came out, and, and thus the fame kind of spread. By the time I did the second edition, 2008, the cocktail revolution had reached a point where it was ready for something to happen. And for some people, it ended up being my book. It was an accident of timing, but it was also done to the way that I like things. And then I could joke, I want to be able to walk into a bar and order my favorite drinks. Well, I can now. I certainly can. The Corpse Reviver number two, the Boulevardier, there's another one I reintroduced, and just a bunch of others. And this sort of takes us along, how am I doing? Okay, <laughs> 10, 10, got it. 10 seconds left, no. Um, and I've watched the world since then. And by the way, first of all, I'm told I brought like eight copies of my book, second edition. They said people just ran, ran up to them and took them away. 
actually, they, I think they hid four copies. So, so if somebody wants to try to buy one of those things, you can. You can also buy it on Amazon. And here's the end of this plug. Prohibition, 100th anniversary, this coming year. Same publishing company, glutton for punishment, says, Dad, can you write a little additional section on prohibition? We will give you a signature. And a signature in the publishing business means it's a certain cut fold, and it works out to 16 pages. And I was on the phone with them, and I was like, <laughs> better make it two signatures. So, a hundred pages later, I've got this thing done, and I'm very pleased with it. And I'm telling them, you should just make it its own book. I can expand it further. I can do this. But no, my, my lot in life is I write one book, and then I make everybody buy it three times. So this is coming, this is the third time coming up here. And you will want it for the same reason you'd want my second edition. The, sec the first edition, it's collectible. But the, the, that edition that this young lady has right there, yay! Um, I rewrote every word of it. When they say a revised edition, there is nothing that was left unscathed in that. And yes, some corrections, don't judge me. But, so that, that's what it was. Well, this book is the same way. Only, I was such an annoying fellow about it. In the end, they just said, okay, you can be the art director of the book too. So, I get my whole section in, added to this book, and now they're gonna let me make sure every image in that book goes exactly with every other thing in the book, with every line of text, which I write, I'm, a re I'm the best writer since William Shakespeare. Really, I am. But anyway, so every picture matches. This is something writers never get. They never get that kind of, kind of integration because they don't have all that. They don't have that ability. So I'm really excited about this. It's gonna come out sometime next year. Exactly how long, I don't know. They don't know, because it took me a little while to do that. And they gave me the rest of the book. It wasn't just the new section I'm art directing, mind you. Here, you get to do the whole book. And I'm like, crap, I, I, I knew the software. I am a graphic designer, but you know, I'm looking at at least two sets of people's, other people's work. Because first edition, second edition. I had complaints after the first edition. They corrected them in the second edition. This time, I just totally, the picture, I mean, I made the pictures bigger. Um, I added tons of recipes, at least 50% more recipes than in either edition. And all of these new recipes are from Prohibition. So the, there are very uncommon recipes. Now, I had already had the main prohibition recipes in the earlier editions. The monkey gland. Do you guys know about the monkey gland? Some of you? The monkey gland was a drink that was a, a satirical drink, as a lot of the prohibition drinks were. It was named for the experiments of a Dr. Sergi Voronov. And what he thought was he could centrifuge some nice monkey testicle, inject it into males, and make them stronger and more virile. So they immediately create a cocktail called that. And everybody drank it and laughed at him. So we've got that, and we've got some other prohibition drinks in there. But this time I went to all of the old Prohibition bar guides, which I had by this point collected. I virtually have all the important bar guides between, oh, 1805 when the, was that, was that the right date? Oxford uh, nightcaps, something around, maybe it was 1820. Anyway, 
all those guides, and I'm just scouring the ones during Prohibition for great drinks, especially ones that have nice Prohibition names. So they will all be in the book too. And all of this began with me looking for orange bitters and trying to figure out what the hell anything was. And without the internet, I'm really a miracle of science. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Great pleasure. Once again, once again, Kiev, let's hear a huge welcoming round of applause for the elusive Ted Haig Dr. Cocktail. Oh.